Are you sitting with a whole bunch of alerts that all seem seemingly meaningless? This clip's for you. In this folder, I've got a whole bunch of configuration files. I'm gonna talk through them and kind of the logic of what you would use them for. Because remember, this breakout session is really about making alerts easier to handle. But I'm gonna even abstract that farther than that, it's data. Like if I bring in Windows logs, if I bring in IDS alerts, if I bring in DNS, maybe you want to take that raw data, even when it's parsed into fields and make it better. So that's kind of the logic we're doing here. But the use case, one of the best use cases you can possibly have is your SOC, or even if you don't have a SOC, you have alerts. Alerts are coming in and you're supposed to look at them. <laughs> can be intimidating because the list of alerts goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So what I want to do is walk through how to make that a better process, a more efficient process. So in here, let's just imagine for a second, we're getting alerts in, say you've been attacked. There's been a phishing attempt. There's been, okay, something came in. What I want to do always, in my opinion, is I want to take that alert data and I want to give it more context because if I can get additional data about the alert, like instead of an IP address, what if I have a domain name? Like, and it's a randomly generated long domain name, like a DGA, a domain generating algorithm name. Well, in that case, what I can do is I can assume <laughs> that's bad. Randomly generated long domain attached to an alert, but before all you had was an IP address. So what I'm doing here is these are Logstash configuration files. So you wouldn't need Logstash for this tool. I like to demo with Logstash because I can put Logstash in front of Elastic, Splunk, QRadar. It can front end effectively anything. But even if you're like, I'm never going to use Logstash, that's fine. Mimic the same concept in whatever your tool is. So let's just kind of start with some basics here. I'm going to show you kind of a completed start to finish kind of example. And then we'll kind of work backwards and go to each technique individually. So we're gonna go to the enrich folder and I'm gonna play with this. The first one I'm gonna run is just this field list which shows us what data we're dealing with. And I'll open it in a second and show you it. So this is running and I'm gonna go ahead and full screen this for a second. And it's just about done. And what this is going to do is it's just going to print out the data we're dealing with. I've got two alerts here. So again, I'm going to show the completed kind of enrichment pipeline, and then I'll go back and show individual techniques. So here we're dealing with two alerts. We've got alert number one, which is, hey, guess what? You've got some type of weird hex ASCII PDF dictionary entry. Uh, it's a network Trojan, maybe. <laughs> uh, and it's sourcing from the internet, but it's going to an internal. How did that happen? How did something from the outside connect inside to say like a workstation or a server? Is this a web server that I own? No, this is actually a workstation. What's happening? And this is true of both commercial and open source tools the way the alert signature is written, the direction of the flow it's investigating might be reversed, in which case the source IP and dest IP are actually flipped. So one way as an analyst, you might try to think about this is the low port is usually actually the destination. So this is actually the source connecting out to, in this case, the destination port of 80. So the, their source and destination are flipped in this example. I didn't flip them, it's just the way the alert engine works. So some weird PDF thingy versus our second alert down here, we've got a EXE or DLL file has been downloaded. It's a possible privacy violation. Again, we've got the source and destination flipped in this one as well. And your job is 
are these evil? Are these malicious, suspicious, and benign or benign? The very concept that you got these alerts usually means something bad happened or that they're at least suspicious. What I want to do is use enrichment techniques to automatically shift this to either benign or malicious. So, and by the way, let me open this config file just so you can see what I, all of these, you have the complete code. So you can see here at the very top, once this loads, is I'm showing, I'm starting with two alerts, just like they would come from Snort or Suricata. And then I'm just doing regex parsing right here. If you're not used to regex, you're like, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> That's all I did with this one. Next though, I'm gonna run something a little bit more fancy. I'm actually gonna go through the full enrichment gambit here, which is technically not all the things I would do. I would actually do more than what I'm gonna show. And I'll talk through this. I'll let that start to run just cause it takes just a little bit to start up. But look at this. So we start with the same two alerts. I parse them out with grok, but notice in this time I'm adding more to the config. I'm doing a geo IP of the IP addresses, both the source and the destination, because it's IDS alerts what we're playing with right now. And so sometimes they're flip-flopped and the external IP is actually a source IP. So I'm running against both to grab ASN and BGP information. That's not city, state, country, by the way, that's ASN, autonomous synchronous numbers. That will show like BGP routing numbers and the entity that owns or hosts that IP space. That's gonna be helpful. I'm also getting the standard city information. That is city, state, country. What we're used to getting with like the pretty pew pew maps. I'm also doing basic tagging. Like this is actually one of my favorite things. Hey, if it's a starts with a 10 dot or a 192.168 dot or this 172.16 through 31, it's an RFC 1918 private IP. Well, if the destination is an RFC 1918 IP address, it's an internal destination. Otherwise, let's treat it as a external destination because it's probably external. In my full configs, I actually go a little bit farther because it could be a multicast address. It could be a broadcast. This one, it's either internal or it's not. I usually kind of break them out. You know, internal, multicast, broadcast, external. So we can do that. I did the same thing for source. And here's where some of the magic starts to happen. Let me talk through this one first. What this is doing is it's trying to go from an IP address to the DNS that the machine that connected to the external IP address resolved to. Now think of this like this. I do nslookupgoogle.com. Now, if I were to browse to google.com, my machine would go here. Well, if my machine's going there and I get an alert about it, I want to be able to go from the IP back to the name. Well, if I do an NS lookup of the IP address though, watch what happens. It resolves to this. That's not google.com. Nope. Because this is a reverse lookup, a PTR record. And so the reverse lookup one is actually really slow. If you're handling millions or billions of logs a day, this is a really expensive lookup. Two, it's not accurate. It is not accurate. Therefore, I don't like doing DNS lookups within any type of log aggregation or SIM tool. There's edge use cases where it's actually really helpful. But as a general rule of thumb, I don't want to do it. So I don't. So instead of doing an actual DNS lookup with the SIM, which you can do, I do cross correlation with the SIM. So in here, I have logs normally that would go into a tool called Logstash, which would then write them to a backend storage system called Elasticsearch. But in this case, I'm assuming I have DNS logs collected and in Elasticsearch. So what I have Logstash do as alerts come in is it actually queries Elasticsearch. And it's saying, hey, do you have in your DNS logs something that had an answer, basically it was resolved and had an answer of the IP address in the alert, that source IP, if the external IP is the source. 
And if you find it and there's a match, please pull in the query field. That is much more useful. It's much faster. And I can now have the actual DNS at the time it was requested. And you could make this more specific. And I could do another and that said it had to have sourced from this client, which would in this case be the destination IP. 